At the turn of the 20th century, the historian Mary Ritter Beard observed that scholars had written women out of history. Mary Ritter Beard knew that women had done things, but they weren't anywhere. They were invisible. The historical record didn't show them. They were like ghosts. No one, male or female, can really know history without knowing its female half. But it's especially important for women of all races and groups and classes because otherwise, if we don't see a history in which there are women, we think we can't create it. As a member of a generation who was taught while well on this campus that women were given the vote, I was therefore made to think that things would be given to me and I didn't have to uh, and shouldn't, <laughs> you know, ask for them, much less fight for them. Hoping to inspire the writing of a history in which women were the active co-makers of society, Mary Ritter Beard began to gather primary sources. Diary by diary, artifact by artifact, her collection grew. By 1940, Beard needed a place to preserve these materials. She found her most ardent ally in Margaret Storrs Grierson, the Smith College archivist. In Margaret, she found not only a person who caught the inspiration and the necessity for this task and was ready to commit to it, but an institution which would house it at Smith College. The first collections that Margaret Storrs Grierson began to gather were suffrage materials of Carrie Chapman Catt, Civil War nurse Clara Barton. The Garrison family papers came to us under Margaret's watch in the early days, and um, they are a wealth of material on not only the women's rights movement of the 1840s and forward, but the abolition of slavery. There were choreographers and sculptors, dancers and poets, doctors and lawyers. Margaret collected very bravely. She collected people who were radical in their politics. Grierson worked tirelessly to gather what she called fresh materials from which to rewrite pages of our nation's history. As these materials poured in, Grierson named them the Sophia Smith Collection, the SSC, which is today one of the foremost women's history archives in the world. If these weren't here, they wouldn't be anywhere. Traditional archives would have rejected these letters. You know, Martha Washington's papers are not saved. We have virtually nothing in Martha Washington's handwriting because traditional archivists said, we're looking for George. We know who's important. Today, as in the past, acquiring a collection is only the beginning of an archivist's work. Some of our donors are, are neat and organized, and others are moving too fast on the cause that they are promoting to take time to organize their papers. Boxes and boxes and boxes laying on tables and papers and on files, dirty old files and, you know, pictures and I don't know if you, how many videos, you know, it's a lot of stuff. There's just everything. I mean, I don't know what's there, you know, in fact, I, 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 I can't wait to, to find out what's in my archives. When a collection's time comes, when it reaches the head of the long queue of unprocessed collections, you sort it, you arrange it, so there'll be a stack of correspondence and a stack of newsletters and a stack of minutes. We have to figure out uh, what are the most important categories in this woman's life and in what she saved about it. Those poor women, how did they take all those boxes? <laughs> papers and notes and turned it into something. It's an amazing art form. Some materials that come in are fragile. It could be a scrapbook that's on terrible old construction paper uh, and it breaks off as you turn the pages. But we do have some interleave uh, papers mm -hmm. that I had some questions about what we should do. Clippings are coming off in my hand. 
things like that, we have to take some measures to preserve them in the long term. Here's that letter from Margaret Sanger. It was, hmm. cool. It's a handwritten one. I was just kind of wondering whether it's going to be lost in the mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood P Federation papers in mm -hmm. the 1920s, whether people are, are not going to be able to find, whether it's, you know, because it's more specifically about Margaret Sanger. Mm -hmm. You should just make a note of this, because I think it's too early in the process to know exactly how it fits in and when we've, like, uncovered things in the other boxes and have more of the context, then it'll probably make more sense. Okay. Archivists have to combine several different qualities. They have to have enough knowledge of women's history to put these women into context to know their importance and to know which subject headings to choose. But archivists also have to have an attention to detail and a patience with the tedium of this arranging. But the uh, bonus is that you get to read other people's mail. It's unpredictable what kind of material will turn out to be the piece that captures uh, something we need to know about a past generation. So that I'm always surprised, I'm always surprised. I come here and I think, I'm gonna find out secrets today. No documents, no history. Documents are to a historian what a laboratory is to scientists. Without historical documents, you simply cannot write a full, complete, and compelling history. By the early 1950s, enough documents had been collected that the author and activist, Eleanor Flexner, could set out to write a history of American women. She cast about trying to find out where the best sources for doing this would be. She realized before too long that uh, the Sophia Smith collection was the best place for her to do her research for this book. Flexner's path-breaking work, Century of Struggle, was published in 1959. It offered a sweeping survey of how women of all classes had fought for racial, economic, and political equality. Equal pay for equal work, when do we want it now? Equal pay for equal work, when do we want it now? Equal pay! As the women's movement begins to grow, feminists are looking for their history. And the best place for them to turn uh, was Century of Struggle. Uh, and so the book had an enormous impact. All of a sudden, the women's movement came along and I said, hey, what's the history here? I discovered a gold mine, but when I came here, and I was looking at the papers of Margaret Sanger. And I think the thing that moved me most was that I saw letters to Margaret Sanger from ordinary women in their own handwriting talking about how desperate they were to be able to control the number of children they had. And I began to realize that these were not elite, privileged women. These were people whose need to reduce their family size was basic and economic and a matter of survival. If I had not seen those at the beginning, I would not have grasped that I was really talking about a grassroots movement. Linda Gordon's history of birth control was just one piece of an explosion of scholarship that tapped the resources of the SSC to establish the importance of women as agents of social change. discovering, you know, this whole long history totally changed me. You know, how I walk, how I talk, who I am, what I do, just my whole sense of empowerment and uh, strength. The SSC recently opened eight new collections that bring the lessons of women's history to bear on issues today. They contain the papers of activists and grassroots organizations whose struggles for peace, socialism, racial justice, 
women's equality, labor, and welfare rights span the 20th century. One whose work is ongoing is the National Congress of Neighborhood Women. The National Congress of Neighborhood Women is an autonomous network, so you have women that are involved in public housing, tenant associations, you can have rural women in Appalachia involved in land trusts, the farm, economic development. We're the women that are implementing those rights and issues that the women's movement is talking about. <laughs> to me, the, the greatest value is the kind of grassroots record. I get personal letters that are themselves a populist history of, of the movement. It's the individual populist people's history aspect of it that I hope will survive. The fact that Smith was really working with foreign working class women and has had this constantly fostered relationship with grassroots women made me feel that our work would be treated properly. Processing a collection is extremely labor intensive. For example, the eight new collections that we just opened occupied 570 linear feet. That's a tenth of a mile. And to process that, it took about nine staff years. I know, and I'd meet all these people, walk up and say, I worked out your files, and I'd be like, like there's a whole new relationship of young women saying. And you could see that they were excited about some of it, and, and that means they got it. And if you want to, you can grab the stuff now or later, and it's the older to The SSC celebrated the opening of these new collections with a major conference. For two days, donors shared their experiences with scholars and exchanged concerns with the next generation of feminists. I think that the new welfare regime is an attack on women. It's an attack. So I think we can draw a large political coalition that allows us to attribute an economic value to caregiving and really to begin to redefine work not just to gain equality in what has been defined as work. But what people are looking for is a whole new way of doing things. And it means that women that are going into the university and college system or academics that are teaching it have to re-look at how they're partnering with women, poor women. Why aren't more young people involved and active and feeling empowered? And what can we do to encourage us all to do more, show up more, feel less fear, and take a stand. We couldn't do any of this if people like Francis, Jan, Gloria, and all the others hadn't given us their papers so that people forever can learn these stories and uh, make their activism more effective. Knowing the history shows what's possible. It also shows things we've tried before that didn't work, we can now try again. And I'm constantly fascinated. You know, I learned about Victoria Woodhull, who would run for president. I never knew that. And it makes the possibility of a woman running for president seem a little less daunting, because somebody was brave enough to try it over 100 years ago. One of the most important things that we can do for our students is to give them a sense of their own history as women. And one of the most important dimensions of that is for them to be able to deal firsthand with documents that reflect that history. It's extraordinary to watch a student's eyes light up as she realizes that she can use materials where she is seeing the original materials and interpret them perhaps in a way no one else has interpreted them uh, ever before. When you use these primary sources, it, it's there for you to figure out on your own, um, which is difficult, <laughs> to be honest. It's not easy, but it's a, it's a wonderful challenge. It really is, and I think it helps um, you improve as a student. There are many things for us to be proud of at Smith. But I can't think of anything that is more significant to the history of our college and more important to the advancement of women than the Sophia Smith Collection. So I'm exceedingly proud that we're able to offer this resource to our students 
and indeed to scholars around the world. The most challenging need for the Sophia Smith Collection at, at this point is to be collecting uh, more inclusively to, and more actively, more um, aggressively. The history of the widest varieties of women, of lesbians, of African American, of Latina women, collect in a way that reflects the experiences of women in the boldest, most imaginative ways possible. If we only wait for what is given, we're going to continue, I think, to record much better the history of more elite, more prosperous people. To find the history of people who have been at the bottom, we, we really need to go out and search to be asking. For example, in the 1960s and 70s, there was a civil rights movement among Mexican Americans, Chicanos, in which women were very, very active. There's a huge stereotype that Mexican American women are submissive, passive, and not activist, and it turns out to be false. We really need to document this kind of activism. I see the Sophia Smith Collection as playing a role in preparing young women, particularly, for leadership roles by give, showing them role models, allowing them to resonate as they do when they come in here to write a paper. Young women sometimes have to go off and cry for a little while after they've seen a diary that uh, moves them to tears of somebody's struggle to um, pr do her profession in spite of the four kids. I see it as uh, a piece of the women's movement. I hope it's not viewed as something dead, but something living. Museums and archives have, in the sort of patriarchal tradition, been tombs. I think a feminist uh, archive is the very opposite of that, because it is about the continued and greater welfare of, of women and a view of the world as if everyone mattered. A feminist archive is an accumulation of past experience that is valued for its relevance to the future.